Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the epistles of St. John the Evangelist. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the second episode of the first letter of St. John. He began with chapter one, introducing this amazing epistle, this amazing letter, saying that we saw him, we have touched him, we have proclaimed him, and what we are calling you into koinonia, into community. Um, and John is writing this letter because the, the people from the very first century needed assurance that they embraced the true gospel, just as we need assurance as well today. And then he talks about in verse 5 of chapter 1, this is the message we heard, God is light. And he goes on to say, if you think you're in the light, but you're walking in darkness, you're lying. And then he says, if you think you don't sin, you're lying. And if you think you've never sinned, you're lying. Okay, so that's kind of how he sets up the letter. And as we talked about in the first episode, um, a lot of that is coming from the fact that a whole lot of heresy is already being spread. False teaching is already being spread. And, and he's kind of countering that right off the bat. You cannot walk in sin and call yourself a believer. You cannot believe that you are sinless and call yourself a believer, right? Some of the heresies going around believe those types of things. So we pick up in chapter 2. And now he says, he addresses them as my children. My children, right? So this is a very pastoral, very fatherly, very priestly kind of clarifying uh, line. Um, he, he is the bishop. He is echoing the ministry of Christ. And a, a really important thing is that a child is forever a child in the family. Um, they're not servants. They're not employees. They can't lose their status. But a child can be a runaway child. A child can be a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter that, that leaves and comes back again. Right? So they don't leave, lose their status as being children, but they can walk away. And he's warning them against that because he says, my little children, I am writing. It's the first time he uses the first person singular, like I am writing, not just we, not just on behalf of the apostles. I'm writing you myself. <clears throat> and this is why I'm writing you so that you will not sin. And that's like the big part of what he's going to talk about in chapter two. What is sin? Sin is to walk away from the God of life. Jesus' mission is to save us from sin, right? Um, sin is when you know something is wrong and it's gravely wrong and you do it anyway, that's a mortal sin. It's grave. It's serious. You know it's wrong. You do it. You, you disrespect and disobey the Lord. You walk away from the God of life. Dr. Ralph Martin, who lives just down the road from us in in Ann Arbor. Um, Dr. Ralph Martin says, we need to be clear that there will never be a better time or a better set of circumstances than now to respond wholeheartedly to the call of holiness, right? Stop sinning now. That's what Dr. Martin says. And that's what St. John is saying. <clears throat> Don't sin. That's why I'm writing this letter to you, so that you will not sin. Because we have an advocate with the Father. An advocate. The Greek word is the um, parakletos, the parakletos. In the Gospel of John, it's the paraclete. It's just a version of the same word. That paraclete is the advocate, the counselor, the consoler, the one who walks alongside us uh, in our journey. In, in, in the Roman world, the uh, advocate was a, an attorney or a defense lawyer, um, and, and he would he would defend uh, a person in front of the judge. Well, that's kind of what the rule is. That's what John's saying, is we have an advocate. We have a defense attorney. We have someone who's going to stand before us, before the judgment seat. And his name is Jesus Christ the Righteous. Isn't that, it's a title, isn't that great? Jesus Christ the Righteous. And he is the expiation for our sin. 
Now, expiation for our sin, that's, that's a big technical uh, theological term. There is a word study in the, uh, in the Catholic Study Bible that talks about that word expiation. It's halasmos in the Greek, and it can either be um, translated as propitiation or as expiation. Oh, yeah, that makes total sense, doesn't it? That makes it really simple. Um, no problem. We understand it now. Propitiation means like pro, right? It's supporting. It's doing something good. Propitiation is referring to God, to the one who is expiating um, or, or who has seen the expiation. Propitiation is um, when someone is satisfied because of something that was done. So in theological terms, God is propitiated. There's propitiation, meaning he is satisfied with the payment that has been made, right? Uh, expiation, X means to, to move out, right? To do away with, to, to move, to do something with. Expiation is canceling the debt. It's paying the price for our sin. So we get expiated and God is propitiated. Does that make sense? Um, so that Greek word halasmos kind of comes up there. Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the expiation for our sin. He has canceled our debt. He's the one that's paid the price for sin. And not only for our sin, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? Um, that's, that's really amazing. That's, that's really awesome. Um, <clears throat> what is God's ultimate will? God's ultimate will is that everybody will be with him for eternity. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, in 1 Timothy, Paul has three really, really strong lines about how God has willed to save everyone. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners. Who are sinners? Everybody. Everybody's a sinner. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, God wills everyone to be saved and to come to the truth. He wants everyone saved. Everyone. And in First Peter, uh, or in First Timothy, rather, chapter four, God is the Savior of all men. That means He does save. It's He has saved all men, past, present, and future. Is what that means too. But to read those lines by themselves, one might think in um, what what we what we might call a universalism, an idea that everybody is going to heaven, everybody is saved, because it's God's will that everyone is saved. And it makes sense. And that's one of the false teachings that is already circulating at the time of St. John. That it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you sin. It doesn't matter how you live your life. You don't have to walk in the light. You can walk in the darkness as long as you believe in Christ and, and, and um, you've at some point committed yourself to him. He wills everyone to be saved and therefore they will all be saved. Well, St. John does not agree with that thought. <clears throat> Although God has saved, or, or God's will is that he wants to save everyone. God's will is that he has come for the sins of the whole world. But we may be sure, he says in, in verse 3, by this we may be made sure that if we know him, if we keep his commandments, that's how we're going to be sure. We have to know him. And we have to obey. We have to keep the commandments. There's not a universalism where God saves absolutely everybody against their will, right? He's not going to save someone that doesn't want to be saved. He's not going to save someone who deliberately walks away from him. The rest of the Bible is filled with lines from St. Paul, from St. Peter, from St. John, talking about how we have to stay on the right path. We have to walk in the light. Don't deny Christ. Don't commit apostasy. Don't, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, li live in a life of sin. There's long lists, sin lists, about what we are not supposed to do. Jesus himself says the, the road to salvation is very narrow. The road to death is wide, right? It's very broad. So again, we have to hold these scripture verses together side by side. The ones that say he, his will is to save everybody. Yes. But he also says, away from me, you evil um, doer, I don't even know you, right? Those are the words of Christ also. Uh, 
So we've got to hold these in tandem. We've got to hold these scriptures together. We've got to kind of work through this and what it is that all of scripture is trying to say. We don't want to just take one line out one at a time. God is sovereign. God is in control. But we are free to choose whether or not we're going to follow him or not. This letter is all about St. John saying, don't sin. That's why he's writing the letter, he says. My little children, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. Why does he write that? Because they are sinning. That's why he writes this, right? So if they sin, that's a really dark thing. That's terrible. He does not want them to sin because that separates them from the love of God. Right? So even though God wants everyone to be in heaven, even though he, he did uh, uh, die for the sins of the whole world, by this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. Right, And know in the, in the Jewish kind of sense, in the Christian uh, Hebrew kind of sense, is to not only be aware and to recognize and understand, but to know is to be intimate with. To enter into a covenant relationship, to be um, intricately connected in love. With, with the Hebrews, with, with, with the Jews, the idea of to know is connected with like Adam and Eve. Adam knew Eve and she bore a son, right? It's an intimate knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. It means that they were together. They were intimate. Well, God wants us intimate with him. And this is how we know that we know him we follow his commandments. If we are intimate with God, if we're really close with him, we're going to obey him. Verse 4 says, he who says, I know him, but then disobeys, is a liar. St. John's favorite thing to say. A liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps the, world, the word in him, truly love for God is perfected. It's the first time this word love shows up in this letter. Here in, in verse 5, the love here is agape love, right? The most noble kind of love, the act of the will, to want what's good for another person at my expense. God kind of love. And that's what shows up here. And um, if we can be sure that, that uh, by this we can be sure that we are in him, he who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We ought to walk in the same way that God walked. Now, this is really not a good translation in English. The ought to walk is really an imperative. It's not a suggestion. It should read, whoever claims to abide in him must walk as he walked, must live as he lived. It's more of an imperative um, than just a thought. And in verse um, 7, he starts talking about a new commandment. And it's, it's quite funny because in verse 7 he says, I'm not writing to you a new commandment. I'm writing no new commandment. It's an old commandment. Yeah, they've learned this from the Bible ages ago. The Old Testament talked about this a long, long time ago. Obeying God, loving God. We already know this. In verse 8 he goes, yeah, I am writing you a new commandment. So there's another great example of you read one line apart from another line, and, and you can get to totally two completely different points of view. you got to read them together. In one sense, it is not a new commandment, right? It's not new. Moses talked about this way back in Leviticus, in, in, in Deuteronomy, in the book of Exodus. Moses talks about loving God and obeying God. Um, uh, what Moses taught is, is what Abraham believed before him. And what Abraham be believed before him is what Noah believed before him. And what Noah believed before him is what Adam and Eve first learned. Where did they learn it? From God himself. So he's saying this is not a new commandment. Um, this, is, this is old. The, the whole Jewish faith has been built on the same idea. We love God and we obey him. Yet it is a new commandment. It is a new commandment because now... There's a new uh, covenant that's taken place. There's a new chapter in the salvation story where now the light of Christ is actually amongst us and with us. And not only that, the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we have the power to obey. We have the power to say yes, right? We have the will 
the power, the knowledge, the fortitude, the courage, all the rest of that to actually do what it is we're supposed to do because now we have the Holy Spirit, right? Um, I am writing to you, and I am writing a new commandment, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The true light is Christ. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, they were waiting for Christ. They were waiting for the light. It's new now because the light has come. And they have access to that light through the paraclete, the parakletos, through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus. In verse 9, he says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Now, this is huge. One of the ways we can determine whether someone or, or an institution or a group is in the light or outside of the light, how do they treat their brothers and sisters? Now, I'm not going to mention any names. I'm not going to go down a list. I'm not going to make judgment calls. But I think you probably know of different groups who claim to be trying to make the church strong and make the church really good and, and trying to build up the church as a whole. And in the process of that, they destroy our bishops and our priests and our and our Holy Father and the Pope. Right? They're not coming at it at, at, at renewing the church with love, with forgiveness, with patience, with any kind of clarity. They're just like driving this 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 madness of hatred against those that aren't doing the things that they think they're supposed to be doing. Is that walking in the light or is that walking in darkness? St. John says, if you hate your brother, you are in darkness. Now, at the time that he's writing this, some of those that are in the darkness um, are some of those false teachers. Some of those false teachers that have been harassing the apostles and teaching all kinds of heresy, they hated the brothers. They hated the apostles. John says, he who loves his brother and abides in the light and is in it, there's no cause for stumbling. Okay. If you ab abiding, that's a, that's a huge thing here in the, in the scripture. Abiding, that's one of those ongoing lines, um, uh, one of those ongoing themes that John repeats over and over, not only in the gospel of John, but here. To abide is, is to... Uh, live in, to dwell in, right? To pitch your tent, to be attached with, you know, to be surrounded by him, to, to, to walk alongside, to be a part of him. That is to, to abide. And he's saying, if you, if you love your brother, you abide in the light. But if you don't, you don't. Tertullian was one of the early church fathers around the, about 200 AD. And he wrote, Pretty strongly, he named four of these guys uh, that were against the early apostles and, and, and the early teachers of the church. And he says it's kind of interesting. It's a comparatively small thing that certain men like Phygelus and Hermogenes and Philitus and Hymenaeus, like he names four of them, they deserted his apostles, his apostles being Jesus's. And it's a small thing, really, that they did that because the betrayer, the betrayer of Christ, was himself one of the apostles, Judas. And we're surprised at seeing his churches forsaken by some men, although the things which we suffer, Tertullian is saying in 200 A.D., the things that we suffer after the example of Christ Himself show that we are the true Christians show that us, show us to be Christians. We are the real Christians because just like Christ, we are being reviled by brothers who should know better. And they don't. They hate us. Just like Christ said, the world is going to hate you. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What I want you to see here, darkness is not just the lack of light. Darkness has a power. Darkness has some kind of authority. Darkness acts. There's an action. It's alive, an activity. 
it distorts and it blinds because darkness is not just a lack of light. Darkness is who? Darkness is Satan and sin. And all the demons that have fallen with Satan, darkness acts, right? There's a movement in that. It's a power. And it's really important that we catch that. As Christians, we do not believe that Jesus is just alone and darkness means the, the, the lack of Christ. It does mean that, but it also means darkness is its own influence. Darkness is a power. It's the power of evil. We can talk about that a lot more as we go on. And in verse 12, he says, verse 12, 13, and 14, it's really interesting. It's kind of this, this kind of um, poetic uh, little little parenthesis, I guess I want to say. So it's like it's in parentheses. Um, this little offset in verse 12, 13, and 14, he just kind of plops down right in the middle of this thought about not sinning, about being in light and not being in darkness. He, he emphasizes who he's writing to. It's almost like this should be in the beginning of the letter, but he very purposefully places it here, almost like to get our attention. Hey, hey, I'm talking to you. I want to get your attention. And this little off, offshoot, this little offset, little, little bit of poetry here, it's very stylized. It's very repetitive. It just says the same thing twice for the most part. Um, in the Greek, the words are very sing-songy. It's very, very, very poetic. And what he says in here basically is he's saying um, that he's addressing uh, at least two groups of people. Now, this is the, the, the majority thought tends to be from, from all the things that I've looked at. John is writing to little children, to fathers, and to young men. And then he repeats it, children, fathers, young men. And the thought is when he talks about children, like he did at the beginning of this chapter, my little children, he begins at the start of chapter two. When he's writing to children, he's talking to everybody. Everybody is a child of God. Okay, So he's, he's talking to, to his whole audience when he says, little children, all our sins are forgiven. But then he breaks it down into two groups. He talks about the fathers and the young men. The fathers are probably the older, maybe the Jewish believers who became believers in Christ. So they're fathers because they were part of the older faith. They were, they're they're part of that, that original faith that became Christian. And they're, they've been on the road with, with Christ for a while. So fathers, he says, you know Jesus, the son, in a personal way. You saw him, right? And then young men, you've overcome sin. You've started this journey. So it appears like the young men he's talking to um, are those that are new believers. So the, this, little, this little paragraph is kind of offset he says, little children, you're forgiven. Fathers, you know, Jesus, young men, you've overcome, you've started. And then he repeats, children, you know the Father. Fathers, you know Jesus, young men, you're strong and you abide with the word. He just kind of repeats the same thing. Now, in Hebrew, a re repetition of concepts, a repetition of thought is their version of poetry. In English, we usually think of... Uh, um, words that rhyme, right? Words that, there two words in succession that kind of rhyme, that's like poetry to, to a lot of us in, in the English speaking world, world, right? But in Hebrew, it's not so much rhyming words, it's rhyming thoughts. It's rhyming concepts, two concepts kind of back to back. So that's why this whole section is kind of, it's plopped down in the middle here. Right in the middle, talking about light and darkness and don't sin. He goes, hey, by the way, who am I writing to? I'm writing to you, children, fathers, young men. And then he picks up again. And he does this just before this really important thought. And this is how we're going to end, verses 15 to 17. He says, hey, I'm writing to you. Do not love the world or the things of this world. Now, by the world, that's the Greek word cosmos. Cosmos. It's used 23 times in the letter of St. John's. Um, and most often, he's not talking about the created universe. That's good. He's not talking about butterflies and trees and sunsets, right? He's not saying that the, that world is, is evil, that cosmos. That's not what he's talking about. The cosmos he's talking about are the man-made created things that... 
that have fallen because of sin. When he talks about the cosmos in this way, he's talking about the systems, the values, the, the cultures, the vices in human society that have fallen because of sin. And they're against God's plans. They're contrary to the plans of God. And how do you know which cosmos he's talking about? Is he talking about the beauty of the world, the nature, you know, or is he talking about man-made stuff? Well, we know what the context of it. Okay, he, he never is going to say that, um, do not love, you know, the, the creation that God made. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, do not love the world that humans have made, that humans have corrupted, that humans have destroyed. Do not love the world or the things of this world. If you love the world, love of the Father is not in you. You're going to love something. What are you going to love? The stuff or God? You're going to worship something. What are you going to worship? The stuff or God? And he's saying there's not room in the human heart to worship the world, the stuff, and worship God. Jesus had said, you know, love the Lord your God or, or love mammon. You, you can't have two masters, right? It's, it's the same kind of thought. And then he goes into this absolutely amazing little piece that, that I'd love to use in spiritual direction, where he really breaks down sin into three categories. And every one of us, we all kind of battle with probably all three of these at one point or another in our lives. But most of us are kind of designed. So one of these three sins will tend to be our dominant sin. One of these three things tend to be the things that we really struggle with. And it's beautiful and simple. And this is why the paragraph before he says, hey, hey, listen up. I'm talking to you. Okay. What are these three things? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And it is passing away. So don't sink your hooks on them. Don't love them because they're going away. What are these things? The sins, um, the, the lust of the flesh. So the, these are things, this is like sensual uh, lust, the things that, that our body like desires. That's like bodily things, food, drink, sex, leisure, resting, sleeping, um, um, overindulging and, and just relaxation and partying, like the things that that satisfy our physical bodies in a bad way. We're not talking about good ways. Obviously, food and drink and all the rest can be good in their right place, in their proper order. But when it's disordered, when, when it becomes a lust, a desire that puts way too much emphasis on it, it gets out of order. Right? It places it above God. That is wrong. The sensual lust is the lust of the flesh. And all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, the woman, Eve, she saw the food on the tree. She saw the fruit and she desired it because it satisfied something in her flesh, right? So all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we see this rears its ugly head. The second thing he talks about is the lust of the eyes. These are the things that we see that are attractive to us. Things that we might say are greedy things. Things that we can see, that we can touch. Things that other people see that we have. Right? Gold and jewelry and money and beautiful clothes and a nice house and a beautiful car and, and possessions and things. Right? These are the things of, of attraction we might call greed. Like the first one's like what we normally think of as kind of lust. These are like things of greed. And in the Garden of Eden, Eve saw not only that that, that 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 was food that she wanted, but she saw that it was attractive. It was appealing to her eye. And she said, I want that. I want to possess that. She reaches for it. She grasps for it. Right? And the third sin that John talks about is the pride of life. 
So all sins really kind of ultimately flow out of pride because pride is like we put ourselves above God and anytime we say no to God and we sin, that's basically ultimately what we're doing. We're saying, I don't want to listen to you. I want to listen to myself. That's basically pride. But but the third um, of, of the famous threefold lusts, the third one, pride, is, 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 is the lust for power, for control, for doing things my way. I want to be recognized. I want to be in charge. I want people to listen to me. I want to tell people what to do. Right? And in this, this lust is also seen in the Garden of Eden because it's the ultimate thing. Satan says to them, you know, God really didn't say that, that you're going to die if you eat this. You know, if you eat it, you're going to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. And they said, oh, yeah, we do. We want to be like God. In fact, we want to be more wise than God. We want to be more God than God. We want to be God without God. That's the pride of life. And we see it all the way back in the Garden of Eden that these three lusts have kind of played out. So St. John does this beautiful thing where he lays out, look, don't sin, go to confession. That's really what I'm talking about. Don't walk in the darkness. But you know what? I wanna, I wanna show you the weak spots that we have as humans. These are the weak spots. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father, this is of the world. And the world is going to pass away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He who follows God and does what is right actually is connected with, remains with, pitches his tent with God, and abides with him forever. Isn't that beautiful? This is brilliantly written. So if you had read it in the very beginning, if you had read from chapter 2, verse 1 through 17, I want you to read it again after all this discussion and really see how beautiful this flows, the train of thought, the richness with just a very few words, how much John is packed in to this little chapter. It's really amazing. Next time we meet, we're going to talk about the Antichrist, the warning that John is going to give that he says we're in the last hour and the Antichrist is coming. This is going to be a really interesting one. Uh, so make sure that you stay tuned in. All right. We'll see you all very soon. God bless. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for walking the way with us through these epistles of St. John the Evangelist at the Catholic Community Scripture Study.